Everyone has a diversity story, even those you don't expect. Welcome to The Will to Change with Jennifer Brown. Get ready to hear from leading CEOs, best-selling authors, and entrepreneurs as we uncover their true stories of diversity and inclusion. And now here's your host, Jennifer Brown. Welcome to The Will to Change. This is Jennifer Brown. My guest today is Kenji Yoshino. Kenji is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU School of Law and the Director of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. A graduate of Harvard, Oxford, and Yale, he specializes in constitutional law, anti-discrimination law, and law and literature. He's the author of three books, Covering the Hidden Assault on Our Civil Rights, A Thousand Times More Fair, What Shakespeare's Plays Teach Us About Justice, and Speak Now, Marriage Equality on Trial. He is frequently quoted in such media as the New York Times, NPR, CNN, and MSNBC. Along with our previous guest on the Will to Change podcast, Christy Smith of Deloitte, he is the co-author of the 2013 report, Uncovering Talent, A New Model of Inclusion. Kenji, welcome to the Will to Change. Thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I am a big admirer of your work. I've been following you for a long time. I quote you all the time in my circles, and everybody always knows who you are, um, especially for some uh, a substantial amount of work you've done around the concept of covering, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit. But first, I wanted you to acquaint our listenership with a little bit about your story. Um, you are intersectional in many ways, and uh, I know uh, you have navigated your various identities along the way um, in your career, and um, I know you're really introspective about it, and you've written a lot about it, but can you tell us a little bit about how how you discovered your authenticity, how you began to live in a really aligned way, and how, how you sort of brought all those pieces of what makes you who you are together to you know create the person that you are today. Well, first, let me say that the admiration is mutual. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I'd be delighted to uh, give an introduction. And it might even be useful as a way of weaving in an introduction to the concept of covering along Perfect. the way. Perfect. I thought so, so, too. Great. So the way I sort of think about my own development to becoming a sort of comfortably and openly gay man is through three demands for assimilation that weakened over time. So I came out by today's standards relatively late, I suppose, in life because I once uh, just had graduated from college and was at Oxford and um, was on a fancy fellowship. And I re realized that I'm no longer asked to uh, be the interviewer for these fellowships because I always described Oxford as like the global epicenter for depression. Uh, mm -hmm. because I was struggling with my own sexual orientation then. And yeah. I think of that as a conversion phase because the only thing that I wanted to do in that time period was to convert to heterosexuality. The only consistent foray I made from my college rooms in those days was to go to the college chapel to pray to become straight. And uh, to God, I wasn't even sure I believed in. Mm -hmm. So it was only actually after I went to law school that I accepted the fact that I was gay and moved from what I'll call the conversion phase to the passing phase of my life, where I accepted the fact that I was gay, but masked that fact from everybody else. And unfortunately for me, that was the first year that Yale yeah, Law School offered a class called Sexual Orientation and the Law. No one in the regular faculty was equipped to teach it, so they got a uh, person from the ACLU to guest lecture. And I had this dilemma where I had to figure out whether or not to sign up for the class or not, realizing that on the one hand, it might not ever be offered again, but on the other hand, that in 1993, which is the year uh, this was, that uh, if I signed up for the seminar, I would effectively be outing myself as a gay man because the only people who were taking that class at the time were gay women, gay men, and a few righteous straight women, and a straight man would not be caught dead, you know, uh, or touching this class with a 10 foot pole. So ultimately, sort of long story short, I decided that I need to, you know, just have the courage of my convictions and I take the class and as expected, out myself to the entire law school community. 
and have an uh, extraordinary experience there where I discovered not only a uh, deep acceptance that I had never experienced before from the community I was living in, but also within the law, just realizing how much law could do to make the lives of LGBT individuals better. So by the time I graduated from law school, I was this fire-breathing sort of, I was an academic to be sure, but was engaged in a lot of advocacy and was passionate about becoming a law professor and was hired back at Yale on their tenure track uh, to do LGBT work, among other things. But the kind of kicker of this is that no sooner did I arrive at Yale Law School than I encountered a third and yet subtler demand for conformity. So, you know, Jennifer, frankly, I thought, you know, by the time I've overcome conversion and passing, I could kind of relax about my sexual orientation because everybody knows I'm gay. The people who hired me knew that I was gay. And so I could just stop managing my sexual orientation. But as it turned out, a very well-meaning, very friendly colleague put his arm around me and said, if you want to get tenure here, you're going to have a lot smoother ride if you are a homosexual professional rather than a professional homosexual. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant that I would do much better if I were the mainstream guy who taught constitutional law and federalism and separation of powers and the dormant commerce clause and just happened to be gay on the side as a kind of extracurricular activity <laughs> rather than if I were the gay rights guy who was writing on gay rights topics, teaching gay rights classes, you know, writing gay rights amicus briefs and so on and so forth. And such was the terror of the tenure track that for a couple of years I tried to accede, but Finally, I just realized I would much rather not get tenure as somebody who I was than get tenure as somebody who I wasn't. And what made me curious about this was that, you know, I didn't have a term for the demand that had been placed on me. So I threw my net out on the sociological waters and came up with this term covering from Irving Goffman, which is his term for when an individual tries to conceal or downplay a known identity. So it differs from passing in that people know that you belong to the group, but uh, it is very similar to both conversion and passing insofar as it's the demand for assimilation. So the idea is it's fine for you to be gay, but downplay it. Don't write on gay stuff. Don't bring your same-sex partner to work events, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it was only after I overcame the covering demand that I finally felt fully authentic in the workplace. And then I began to apply that to other contexts in my life where I felt like I had an outsider identity, being Asian American, being the most obvious of those. But the thing that struck me as really critical is that while conversion and passing didn't relate to being a racial minority, because very few people, if any people, were asking me to either convert or to pass, right, mm -hmm, on the mm -hmm. basis of race. Mm -hmm. Many, many people were asking me to cover on the basis of race by, quote unquote, acting white or uh, downplaying uh, my advocacy for Asian American issues or so on and so forth. So I hope that helps as a kind of thumbnail autobiography that also uh, situates some of the key concepts that we'll be talking about today. Yeah, that's perfect, Kenji. And I can so relate, you know, the evolution that I experienced first as an HR professional, then as a leadership expert, and then morphing into a diversity expert and 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 the the feeling of finally joining all those pieces that you'd sort of um, you'd minimized and spent so much time um, distancing yourself from and all the energy that goes towards that, which you talk about in your research, you know, you actually quantified it in your research that it has an impact on our, a negative impact on our self-esteem. And so, you know, we're carrying this around. And I mean, did you have a moment when you realized it, like, you could actually relax and breathe? Did it feel like you were throwing off a, you know, a, a weight that you'd been carrying at, at some point where you were like, and I can do this, I can be authentic, I can work from my passion, and it's not going to harm me. You know, what, what year was that when you really kind of felt that truly for the first time? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would date it somewhere in the middle of my tenure track when I made that fateful decision of I'm just going to go for it and write about what I'm passionate about because it seems ridiculous to cut myself off from my passions in this way. So mm. if we think about uh, my stepping onto the track uh, as 1998, I would say somewhere in the early 2000s, that was when I sort of decided I'd rather not get tenure or somebody who I am rather mm -hmm. than anything else. 
And so that did feel like a lead overcoat had fallen off of me because I was finally reconnecting to all the passions that had brought me uh, to that point in the first place, which is, you know, all these gay rights cases. Think about the early 90s, right? Mm -hmm. It was like run up to, uh, sorry, the early 2000s. This is like when Romer has been decided. This is a run up to the big Lawrence case that overturned Bowers versus Hardwick. So the Lawrence case is seen as a Brown versus Board of the gay rights movement. So all this is breaking in the air around me. You can just see that it's electrifying. And here I am sitting on the sidelines kind of being gay, but downplaying the fact that gay. <laughs> so flipping over to sort of saying, I don't really care anymore whether I get tenure or not. What I care about is my integrity as a person and as a scholar and writing about the things that I care about. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, you know, in Yale Law School's defense and to its credit, that it was just that one person who had given me bad advice because... Mm-hmm. As soon as I said, I'm going to keep writing about the things that I care about, you know, everybody on the faculty, except for that one individual whose advice I had taken. So it's on me for having listened to that one person. Mm -hmm. But everyone else was like, where has this person been for the past three years? Like, this is a person (laughs) whom we hired. Like, you seem to have such a fire in your belly and such a passion for your topics. And then you went really quiet for a couple of years. And we were frankly getting really worried about you. And then ironically, right, three years later, I got tenure unanimously, you know, flipping even the colleague who had given me the bad advice. And so obviously I was lucky. So I don't want to say this is everyone's experience or this is even generalizable. But Mm -hmm. I at least want to sort of put out there that there is a deep connection between working on the things that you're most passionate about and doing your best work. Right. Sure, and so sure. This is not just a question of did it harm me, which, as you say, when we did our survey results, we found that, you know, of the people who reported covering 61 percent of our survey sample, 60 to 73 percent, depending on the axis of covering that uh, we were talking about, said that it was somewhat too extremely detrimental to their sense of self. And so even adopting a very parsimonious definition of harm, that's a very, very high number. A super majority of individuals are reporting harm. But then it's also a question about the organization, because of the 53% of people who said that their leaders within the organization expected them to cover, 50% said that it's somewhat to extremely diminish their commitment to the organization. Mm -hmm. So if you want people to actually cut back to the organization and make the organization their own, it's really important that you not impose these covering demands on them. That's right. Oh my God. I think it's so resonant and and people, people can really connect to the concept. I want to just um, go back to one concept you talked about though, that it always strikes me. It's not just the energy we put towards minimizing a stigmatized identity, you know, that is um, harmful to us, but it also prevents us from building trusting relationships and becoming trusted uh, colleagues. And I was just in a senior, a room of senior out uh, LGBT women. Um, there was a, a meeting called Out Women, which is incredible because it's it's you know so unusual to be in a room of women like that. I mean, it's all it almost never happens. So when you're in those rooms, you're like pinching yourself because you know we we can barely find each other. And then when we get together, it's like you can breathe a sigh of relief to say at least we're out there. You know, we may not be connected as a community because we're going about our lives, but particularly in the senior levels. Um, there's there a lot of women have achieved this tremendous success, but I think have still been isolated throughout their career paths to a great degree. So we're in the same room and on the panel is talking about how um, when we are not fully ourselves in business relationships, where it is said about us that, well, I don't know who that person is exactly. Or, you know, the performance feedback might be like, I, you know, I, I don't know if I really know who their family is. You know, I don't know if I trust them with this deal or I'm not sure I can really promote them uh, because there's not that kind of the sharing that goes on between, you know, heterosexual colleagues. And, um, and, the, and so the harm, the harm is also in terms of, you know, the higher up you get in the corporate ladder, the more important relationships are. And the more people really need to know everything about you in order to put you in charge of, you know, a giant, uh, you know, P&L or, you know, a huge region of a, of a company. And gay people have gotten so good at kind of putting their personal story to the side. And by the way, working double hard 
to kind of hang on to the status that they do have, that they become this like unknowable person. And, you know, that that is exhausting, but it also, I think, gets in the way of our success too, because, you know, people don't, they don't know the richness of who you are. So I just love the story you said that they were like, wow, where has this person been? You know, and and uh, they wanted to know all of you, which I think is is surprising for some of us to actually realize that that's been there all along. I think that's exactly right. And um, an extremely astute comment. I hadn't quite uh, put it that way to myself before, but um, the way I'll connect it to uh, uh, my own story was, uh, and I hope that this isn't too uh, mawkish, but, you know, before I came out, you know, I had very wonderful and continue to have very wonderful parents. And they would say, I love you all the time. And I trusted the love, but I didn't trust the you because um, the you that I was presenting to them was a heterosexual version of myself. So they didn't really know the real me. So it was only af- actually after I came out to them that I trusted not only the love, but I also trusted the you that I felt like they, when they said, I love you, that they actually really meant me <laughs> rather than some other person. Again, that's mm-hmm. their fault. That's my fault because I was hiding myself from them. And I think that's a very, a very similar thing happened to me in my work space, as you've just described, which is to say there was a lot of comments about, like, I respect you, right? But Mm -hmm. if you don't trust the you on the other end of the equation, either as a person at whom the comment is being directed, because you feel like, how much do they really respect me when they don't really know me, right? Or alternatively, as a person who's making the comment, like, I respect you, there may be a kind of comma, but I don't really know you, or there's something that I can't even put my finger on that makes me feel distant from you. So Mm -hmm. in fact, like we're lucky if someone says, oh, I, you know, really like that person. I've heard this too many, many times, not just on sexual orientation grounds, but on race grounds or on gender grounds or what have you. I really like this person, but this person is not fully comfortable in their own skin around me. And so therefore I can't, you know, fully sort of embrace this person as, you know, a friendly colleague or someone whom I would trust with a really big uh, deal. And we're lucky if somebody's articulate enough to and self-conscious enough to be able to say that. I think much more often it's just this inchoate sense of I'm trying to build this network and I'm going to pick these people and not these other people. And these other people are defined not so much by any kind of conscious decision making, but rather more like oh, I don't feel comfortable around this person. Mm-hmm. I don't know this mm-hmm. person well enough. And you may not be even be able even to verbalize that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, we have this really powerful moment in our LGBT training that we do for a big bank where we take all of the – we think about what are the gifts that we have gained as leaders that are LGBT people. And, you know, when you do a big brainstorm and people come up with things like resiliency and resourcefulness and courage – and emotional intelligence. And I say, these are things that were earned because of a, of a challenging personal situation, you know, about your, your very identity and who you are and being seen. We had to, we had to learn how to overcome that, um, using 15 different tools in our toolkit. You know, we had to get really creative about how do you build a relationship with people when you're actually hiding (laughs) most of who you are? How do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you ascertain whether you're safe? physically um, or emotionally in a certain situation, and you have to get the work done anyway. And, you know, when we kind of do that flip, people just, it's a transformation in terms of how they actually value the the challenges of adversity and what it has built and forged in them is so amazing to see. And, and it's like their favorite part. And we call it the gifts of being LGBT. And, you know, I ask them, you know, how did it create you to be a different leader? And by the way, how has it now equipped you to be the kind of leader that your company needs the most, you know, now and in the future? And if you can connect those dots, and I think this is true for all diverse talent, you know, we've We've been, we've looked at our deficits, I think, because of our identity for so long. And yet in the companies I consult to, the very variety that they're looking for and that adaptability and flexibility and, you know, ability to, you know, read a room and and to shift and be flexible or to be creative about problem solving or taking risks, you know, all of those things, you know, to me sound like the competencies of every leader of the future. So, you know, I, I think that diverse talent has so much to teach from their experiences. And yes, it was hard one, but I think, 
but I, I really see a day and I hope for a day when we are emulated because of perhaps what we've been through. I think that's exactly right. And I think that one of the things that, uh, not just I think, but I know that one of the things that's in the literature about leadership is that authenticity is a really key pillar of leadership and that people are unwilling to follow people whom they view to be inauthentic. And I think that when you're talking about the LGBT context or anyone right, who is willing to be out there as a diverse person, but nonetheless articulate themselves as comfortable in their own skin, is uh, someone who is being authentic and therefore is worthy of emulation. There are many other metrics along which uh, we could think about diverse candidates bringing leadership by virtue of their life experience, such as the empathy or the sensitivities that uh, you were raising earlier. But I, I think that if I were to take away the nub of what you were saying, what it really would be for me is if somebody just says to me, I am gay and openly like that, then I actually know so much about that person, or at least I think I do, with regard to the amount of courage that that person has, the mm -hmm. amount of uh, commitment to authenticity, uh, the amount of resilience that that person must have had to be able to say that, the amount of independence, right, to not take other people's for judgments for their judgments, right? So it's actually a vast panoply of characteristics. So one of the things I'm really fond of saying is that when I think about this tribe of gay people, right, uh, mm. I think that the commonality that's most important among us is, you know, by far the least important commonality is sexual orientation, right? In terms of like, by far the least common, uh, important commonality is like the gender to whom we are attracted, right? And the much more important set of commonalities is what it means to have grown up hiding something, being an outsider, needing to figure out, you know, when to be authentic and when not, when it was safe, when it wasn't safe, how to empathize with other people who are going through the same struggles, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, like, you know, obviously we are defined as gay people by our gender of object choice, but it's really a much richer set of life experiences for which that is still unfortunately a proxy, right? When you say hard one, uh, it's really those hard one attributes that I view to be our true commonalities. Oh, that's so well said. I love that concept. Um, you know, I have to ask about, you know, back to the covering research. The amazing thing about that is the 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 big reveal when I teach it anyway, is is that there's a certain group that engages in covering behaviors and distancing from stigmatized identities, and it is our white straight male colleagues. And so could you could you say a little bit more about how that goes across when you present your research and you reveal that? I know what happens for audiences when I talk about it. And it is just this moment, you know, with the audience uh, that is that is so poignant, I think, for so many people. I mean, it's not just for the white guys in the audience to feel seen and heard and maybe for the first time maybe to be included in the discussion, but for everybody else to say that. And, you know, some people laugh and or chuckle. Uh, some people roll their eyes. <laughs> so I wondered how that moment goes across when you talk about it and, 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 and how you interpret people's reactions to it and what it says about our about the whole inclusion conversation today. Yeah, again, thank you for the question, because I have the exact same experience of feeling like that uh, in a way is a kind of key finding of our study, which is that 45% of individuals uh, who are straight white men report covering on at least one axis. And this study, by the way, is a study that I did in conjunction with um, my colleague Christy Smith at Deloitte. Uh, it's available for free on the internet. It's called Uncovering Talent, a new model for inclusion. But when we uh, pushed out the survey on covering, one of the things that didn't surprise us was that uh, cohorts that have historically been subjected to uh, discrimination or bias or exclusion from the workplace reported very high levels of covering. So 83% of uh, gay individuals, 79% um, of African-American individuals. But the thing that did surprise us was that 45% of straight white men reported covering. And when I reveal this to the audiences that I talk to, I get exactly the same <laughs> response. Uh, a a friend of mine was joking to me about this because uh, she uh, is a body language expert. So she was telling me, just watch uh, people's feet uh, because <laughs> people's feet don't lie. They always point to where they want to go. And if you're a diversity and inclusion person, uh, and I suspect you experience this too, and you have to present to corporate boards and boards of trustees of universities or uh, foundations who are predominantly 
you know, pale male and yell, right? Um, <laughs> then um, you get a lot of resistance because people quite understandably associate diversity and inclusion with uh, the irony of diversity and inclusion is that straight white men are excluded from these paradigms. And so we're going to spend the next hour beating up on me, right, is the way in which uh, many straight white men experience these conversations. So when they hear that 45% of straight white men report having, you know, the secret self that they feel like they can't bring into the workplace, immediately the feet reshuffle. You can practically hear it. And if you're mm-hmm. looking for it, you can certainly see it in all of the body language. It's not just the feet realigning from the door to you. Uh, it's also that arms that are crossed get uncrossed, that people who are leaning back in their chairs lean forward, because now they're genuinely curious because they have the follow-up question, which I'm sure you get as well, is, uh, which is, how do we cover? Like, what, what is this 45% of, uh, of straight white men covering? And of course, we have answers to that, including things like age, uh, socioeconomic status, mental or physical disability or illness, uh, religion, and veteran status, right, are among the top answers that uh, people have given on our surveys. So that is a really important, you know, atmospheric moment where people finally realize that this is a diversity and inclusion paradigm that is capacious enough to include them and that they as straight white men are not going to be lionized or demonized in the conversation, but are actually in the soup with the rest of us in it, in the search for greater authenticity in the workplace. Right. So mm. it can't be to I know I'm sure many of your listeners are sort of immediately coming in with uh, the kind of head scratching question of, well, are you really saying that there's, you know, all forms of covering are bad? And of course, I'm not saying that, you know, for me to speak English or to have manners or what have you are, um, you know, forms of assimilation and therefore of covering. But where we land in the study is to say that, you know, when we try to answer the $64,000 question, which follows on the admission that not all forms of covering are bad, which is how do you winnow out the good forms from the bad forms? The answer is values, right? So many people in their survey said, I have to cover as a Republican or I have to cover as a Democrat. And from our perspective, it was like none of the organizations that we're surveying, this may change in the future, I don't know, but none of the organizations that we were surveying at the time said we believe in the capacity to express your political affiliation at work as one of our core values. That's not an inclusion metric for us. So we thought, you know, there's no hypocrisy going on here. Whereas every organization said it believed in inclusion on the basis of gender, but every organization contained women who said, I have to cover as a woman by, say, downplaying my child care responsibility. So even along that affiliation-based covering axis alone, we had, you know, women in every organization that said that it believed in gender inclusion, saying that they had to downplay their status as mothers. Mm. And in that instance, in that latter instance, we would say that that's an organization that's not living up to its values. Mm-hmm. So with these straight white men, I think that the point is, if what the straight white man is covering is, you know, some kind of, you know, bias against LGBT individuals or any other cohort, then we're, set, you know, I'm kind of like, well, keep that covered, right? Because that's mm-hmm. not consistent with the organization, or maybe you need to find a different organization, or maybe you need to lobby the organization to change its values. But predominantly, it's like, you know, no harm, no foul. But if a uh, individual is saying, as a straight white man, I have to cover the fact that Uh, I am older in a tech company, say, or I am, uh, you know, I suffer from clinical depression or anxiety and I have to cover that. Or even I'm an introvert. You know, I think work styles is increasingly an interesting axis Mm -hmm. of um, study based on, you know, Susan Cain's book, among many others, you know, about quiet, the power of introverts in the world that can't stop talking book, which I think is a classic in uh, its field. Uh, but, you know, when we are talking about things that are either squarely within the anti-discrimination canon uh, or the diversity and inclusion canon, like, you know, uh, mental, physical disability uh, or like, you know, religion or veteran status or age, uh, then that's certainly something that we should pay attention to. And even if it's something subtler, that's an emerging distinction like introversion, we should pay attention to it, too, because it's something that. I can't think of a good, you know, reason for why an organization would say in order to work here or advance here or to be a leader here, you have to be an extrovert, given everything that Kane has argued about the power of introverts, right, which is mm-hmm. to say introverts listen more, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had 
organizations with leaders who are just as renowned for being listeners as organizations who are renowned for having leaders who are great orators. Yeah. Yeah. We need all kinds. You know, I always say, and everyone has a diversity story. I always, I always kind of follow up the information about the covering that's happening amongst white straight men. And I always, I always do say what you said. I heard you say once, you know, it's not the pain Olympics, you know, when we, I think people want to know, you know, who's, who's covering more and how sort of relatively more painful is it? And, and sort of my story is harder than yours. And, you know, all of that dynamic, um, and that conversation I think is, um, I don't know if it's a fruitful one, but I know it's going through people's heads. And so I always try to say to audiences, it, it, that's not the point. You know, the point is to build the kinds of workplace cultures where um, everyone can share their human experiences about things others may not know about them. And, you know, when I see a often straight white male executive, for example, telling their diversity story and really making a point to be vulnerable um, I do believe that something shifts in their followership uh, there that they are viewed, especially by millennial talent as an authentic leader uh, who who kind of gets inclusion and is and is putting themselves out there. And it, 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 I have to convince them that it has this incredible effect because I'm not sure they always see it. But I do believe it's going to be more and more critical to hear from everyone about their diversity stories and more broadly defined. And, you know, what what did being an introvert in a sales organization mean in terms of how you developed as a leader? You know, that's that's a really interesting story of exclusion and a story about being uncomfortable and a story about not being a part of the group. Um and and I do believe there are some if we can kind of connect people into that, but I mean it's 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 but it's heavy stories too. I mean I've had people, I've had straight white male male executives come out about their political views, their religion, their disability, um, having a child with substance abuse issues that was suicidal. It's a bit incredible the kinds of things that people will say, but often they will come up to me afterwards and say it. They don't necessarily say it in front of their peers. So you can also see that the, the, that group mentality is still really powerful um, when, when men are in rooms together. And, uh, but, but it's just been incredible. Um, I, I think we need so much more of that. And, and that's my work. I feel really drawn to making sure that we make this uh, yeah, skill set. And, and I think that... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have to say that I'm of two minds about that. And uh, maybe you can help me out here because on the yeah. one hand, I'm in total agreement, uh, Jennifer, that, you know, if we look at the 45% statistic, I always think, well, you know, this is what people said on the fly on a survey where they're being introduced to the notion of covering for the first time. Uh, I bet that if you let me spend any amount of time with these individuals, that number would go up to 100% because mm -hmm. I have yet to meet a person, for example, when I do workshops and I hand out covering charts and I ask people to fill out mm -hmm. how they cover along my four axes of appearance, you know, affiliation, advocacy, and association, I've yet to meet a person, a human being who's been unable to fill out that chart because, right, you know, having to cover is part of the human condition, right, and part of working in an organization that is not going to be perfectly tailored to in your individual uh, needs. So I agree with, with all of that. And I also think that that, you know, uh, explains or reflects, you know, why people might wait until later to come and talk to you about it, because what they're feeling within the stricture of the um, diversity and inclusion conversation is that if you are a straight white guy, you're not allowed to have a diversity story, right? And so uh, if you're going to communicate that diversity story because you have one, uh, you have to do that to the facilitator afterwards in a discreet way rather than being public about it because otherwise everyone will think that you're whining or that you're not seeing your own privilege or what have you. So agree with all of that and the importance of uh, the work that you're doing. But on the other hand, and this is where I say when I say I'm of two minds, this is the flip side of the coin. I also don't want to create a false equivalency between the 45% of straight white men who are covering and the 79% of African Americans who say that they're covering, right? So I don't want this to be what Iris Bonat calls moral licensing, right? Where I can kind of pat myself on the back by saying, oh, well, that African American individual has to cover but I have to cover two, and so therefore we're totally equivalent. So I'm not looking for the pain Olympics, but I am looking for some kind of attentiveness to data, right? Mm -hmm. And this understanding that 
this notion of covering was immediately available to the African American individual in the way that it wasn't available to the straight white man. Now, again, you could say that that's because right, straight white men aren't allowed to be diverse or to have secret selves. But I think part of it is just honestly that you know African Americans have to work their identity alongside their jobs harder than mm-hmm. straight white man does. So, for example, in our survey, we had no qualitative, <clears throat> excuse me, responses for straight white men with regard to association-based covering demands. And that, to me, spoke volumes about how, you know, there's a lot of bridge building that we can do. We can say that with regard to appearance-based covering, like straight white men have to do it on the basis of age in the same way that, say, an African-American woman might have to do it by straightening her hair, right? But with regard to association-based covering, that's a bridge too far because every cohort other than straight white men is reporting this uh, association-based covering demand of uh, being unable to associate with members of their own group. Mm -hmm. So whether it's Asian Americans, whether it's African Americans, whether it's women, we got reports that said when more than three of us are talking beside the water cooler, someone will walk by and say, are you plotting something? Mm -hmm. Is this a revolution? Is this an NWCP meeting? All direct quotes from our survey, right? So Mm -hmm. If the fact that straight white men didn't report any of that suggests to me that straight white men along that narrow dimension are more able to swim through an organization freely than other groups. So it's those differences that are important too. Ultimately, right, perhaps we don't need to arbitrate. I'm curious to know what you think between those two views of, you know, is there a diff- should we be emphasizing the commonalities or should we be emphasizing the differences? Because I do think that once you show 45% of straight white men cover as compared to 79% of African Americans or 80% of gay people, the fact that everyone is paying the tax, right, Mm -hmm. makes the straight white men who are finally being acknowledged as paying a tax much more sympathetic to the claims of other groups. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we may not need to arbitrate which explanation or which um, way of framing it is correct because in either either way you frame it, the fact that straight white men feel appropriately included within the diversity and inclusion paradigm means that that paradigm is enriched for every group that mm-hmm. seeking mm-hmm. shelter within that paradigm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I agree with your latter, your final conclusion. You know, I think just just including them is revolutionary. Honestly, I. I just can't believe as somebody who's, you know, 46 years old and doing this work, I feel relatively young in this work. And I came into it, you know, very mindful of of my predecessors and the way that we had a race and gender focused conversation in the work really oriented around that for years and years and years. And, you know, we called it like the shame and blame style of dealing with diversity issues in the workplace. You know, and I, I just, I just always wanted something more, you know, I wanted it to be a positive connection and conversation and I wanted it to be, to be about what is universal between us. And, um, I just think that's really resonating with people now. And if it, if it's kind of a blunt instrument, I'm okay with that because it's just, it's so new. It is so new to have people feel they might have something to say about it, to give them a voice. And I think that 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 is going to change the energy of everything, you know, so I but I loved but I'm learning. I always learn so much from you. I love that you were able to to explain that one kind of covering is not like another. And, you know, one group is doing one kind more than the other. And, you know, there is there are differences. There are real differences in terms of people's experience. And, you know, you and I know that. And I spend so much of my time explaining the data to executives in particular to say, if this is not a meritocracy, so you can believe that all of us have equal opportunity, but that is completely dismissing the reality for so many who are starting out, you know, barely, you know, flush with each other and then falling behind over the course of many, many promotions, hopefully promotions and career moves and, you know, covering demands and, you know, to the point where it's like death by a thousand cuts, you know, so many people end up just spinning out of organizations because they just... It is so it is it is overwhelming and exhausting to be the only, you know, in room after room after room to feel that other people get promoted and that you're not on the on the list for the pipeline that it's just it's exhausting. And and I think, you know, people can see it at the at the top of the house. People can see it in their numbers. You know, all they need to do is look at their workforce and segment it by 
identity to understand that, gee, I thought it was an equal playing field. And it's clearly not because we are not able to attract and retain and grow and advance, um, you know, to to be representative of the market and the population that we do business in. And so that's in most organizations, I think that's that trend is really clear. I mean, all they need to do is kind of look at their look at their HR charts and they can see it and they can see it in the pay inequities that that widen over time. Right. They it, there's so much data. So I think so it's it, I think all of this is is it needs to be thrown into the soup, as you say, and um, hopefully our people are different people are convinced by different things. And I think that's why we also need to be really creative in terms of all the different lenses we provide and some, and then, you know, by some miracle we can get maybe 80% of a room on board, <laughs> but, but <laughs> Kenji, I, exactly. go ahead. Yeah. It, if I may, on that last point about how, you know, we need many different levers, uh, in this conversation, um, when I think about uncovering talent, I always think about the case for uncovering talent as being a three-legged stool. So I think of there being a moral case, a legal case, and a business case. So the moral case is the one that uh, sort of threads through, you know, this conversation when we use terms like, you know, equity, right, uh, or justice, right, of just saying it's just a matter of human dignity to allow individuals to uh, allow themselves, you know, their expression of their full selves at work. Uh, with regard to the legal one, I have to say it's a professional deformation that I'm a lawyer, so I, I do tend to look at things through a legal lens. What's been fascinating to me is that back when I wrote the original book on covering in 2006, now you know over a decade ago, um, the law was not doing that much. And so the thesis of the book is this has to be a culture project rather than a legal project because if you know, you're fired for having two X chromosomes, or if you're fired for your skin color, then you're going to win your employment discrimination suit in a hot second. But if you're fired for acting too, quote unquote, feminine, or if you're fired for, you know, stri not straightening your hair, then, you know, the outcome is much less clear. And oftentimes you'll lose in a court of law because the uh, courts are very, very skeptical about protecting mutable or changeable attributes of your identity because their logic is often that if you can change it, then you can engage in self-help. And so therefore the law doesn't need to come in and save you. Um, and the law should be reserved for instances where people can't change uh, the underlying attribute. Mm. But more recently, Jennifer, what's been interesting under the legal rubric is that, for example, in the Abercrombie and Fitch case a couple of terms ago, that the law is kind of catching up to uh, regulate covering demands and penalize employers who impose covering demands. So in the Abercrombie and Fitch versus EEOC case in 2015, what happened was that uh, Abercrombie had a no caps policy and a woman who was Muslim uh, refused to remove her headscarf. Now her headscarf was not visibly of uh, Muslim, you know, um, provenance, right? So you couldn't tell just by looking at it that she was uh, observing a faith. Uh, but nonetheless, the Supreme Court said, look, you asked her to remove something that was uh, her religious paraphernalia. Uh, that's a substantial burden on her religion. And so this is a really easy case. You lose. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is a covering demand. Right. It's a covering demand, ironically, that asks her to uncover something. But yeah, it's ironically, a covering demand that says, you know, as a Muslim, you have to assimilate to the secular or preppy collegiate preppy sort of mainstream. And so you have to remove that headscarf. Uh, and so that's a totally changeable attribute, but the court understood that changeable attributes can often be, if not um, constitutive of identity, at least correlative with an identity in a way that should uh, raise the law's concern. But then finally, in this three-legged stool, besides the um, moral case and the legal case, there's a business case, right? And the business case is both the war for talent that we've been talking about, which is that if you really want a talented workforce and you realize that of the 53% of people who have experienced covering demands from their leaders, 50% feel somewhat to less committed to their organization, that's a wake up call for you as somebody who's managing talent in terms of why you're having so many struggles retaining uh, diverse talent. And then with regard to the work for consumers, Right. The diverse talent is going to understand the end user so much better. And so we have story after story after story about how, you know, uncovering can lead to greater innovation and greater business outcomes, whether that's 
you know, Sandra Lopez, an executive at Intel who creates the charging bowl after a bunch of male engineers are trying to figure out how to charge a wearable that looks like a piece of jewelry. They're agonizing over this. She solves it in a second, right? And <laughs> she says, you know, that looks like a piece of jewelry. I throw my jewelry in a bowl at the end of the day, have a bowl that is a charging bowl that sends an electric current through the bowl. It won't affect the rest of my jewelry, but it will recharge my wearable so that it's ready and fully charged the next day. And they were kind of like, this is miraculous. You're a genius. How'd you come up with this? And she was kind of like, by living my life, you know, this is how I live my life. But the key thing about the Lopez story is that uh, she's totally publicly on the record about this. She said that when she first started at Intel, she did not want to be identified as a female executive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, was very reluctant to intervene in ways that would make her status as a woman, obviously in Silicon Valley, this is an issue, um, more visible than it needed to be. And so... It was only after she engaged in the same kind of struggle internally about authenticity within herself that I described to you earlier on this podcast that she decided that, you know, enough was enough and that she wasn't going to walk by and not make a contribution that would tremendously help the company uh, when she had the insight into the end user that the other engineers on the team didn't have. And mm -hmm. so I multiply stories, you know, from the publishing industry, from, you know, the finance industry. We can talk about those if they're helpful. But, you know, more generally, what we're really interested in at the center, which is a center that I lead on diversity, inclusion, and belonging now here at um, NYU School of Law, is this notion of uh, flow and how authenticity is so connected to flow. So when people talk about having the peak flow experience of feeling like they are at their most creative, you know, at their most productive, they often associate that with losing themselves in their work. Uh, which is very, very correlated to feeling like there aren't any external, you know, restraints on them expressing who they really are in their work. Mm. Oh, my. If we could enable people to feel what that feels like <laughs> on a regular basis, not just here and there, but, it, you know, doing what they love. It's kind of the difference between jobs, careers and callings. And uh, I, I, I'm so fortunate, and I know you probably feel like this too, that we get to work from our passions most of every day, and it's incredible. I, I, you mentioned the center, and I wanted to, I know we don't have much time left, but I'd love to hear the, the you are director of the Center of Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging at NYU, and in the short time we have left, I guess um, I'd love to hear about this word belonging. I'm asked often about what is the difference between diversity and inclusion and, and is in, should inclusion be first and diversity second? And then we have these new chief equity officers like, you know, Tony Profit at Salesforce. Um, we have the um, office of, I think, inclusion and belonging at LinkedIn, uh, which my friend Rosanna DeRuthi is going to be leading, uh, which I'm really excited about. So why, why this, um, is it an evolution to this concept of belonging and, and why do you particularly relate to that or resonate with that? And, and, and do you think it's important to throw that into the mix at this point? Yeah, it's a great question. So let me first uh, cop to the provenance of the term by saying that I uh, completely stole it from President <laughs> Faust at Harvard. So I'm president of Harvard's Board of Overseers this year and I'm on their um, task force for inclusion and belonging. And you know, she was really focused on the word belonging, uh, in part just by her experience of um, figuring out why people left Harvard. And when they left Harvard, they would just say, I don't feel like I belong here. Right. And so it was really that which she was trying to foster. Um, I don't want to put uh, words in her mouth. So now I want to think about this on my own terms. And so when I was thinking about the center, I was thinking, well, diversity is from my, from my perspective, like hardly even an ideal, right? It's just a brute fact of life. Like you either have diversity with regard to demographics or you don't, right? And then inclusion is a build on that, which is to say, once you have a diverse population, how do you create an inclusive culture so that uh, those individuals are not simply uh, invited into the organization and then told completely to conform to the organization in ways that um, make them have to cover or minimize their identities, right? So that's the, it's not enough to get Sandra Lopez as an executive into Intel. She has to feel comfortable enough to make the contribution, 
right? And not sit on our hands and act like all the other male engineers, but to say, look, you guys are getting this totally wrong. Like there's a really mm -hmm. simple solution to uh, this dilemma that is um, torturing you. Uh, and then for me, belonging is a step even beyond that, which is to say you can send all of the inclusion cues that you want, but ultimately, you know, you have to think about what you're trying to solve for and what utopia would look like or what the goal is. And I think what the goal is for all these inclusion efforts is this notion of um, belonging, right? And a feeling like the organization has a stake in you and you have a stake in the organization. And that's really when you really can sort of fully be yourself and feel like that there's a uh, total alignment between your goals and the, uh, and the organization's goals. So that's what belonging means to me. Yeah. And you called it having claims on the community. I loved that. Um, yeah. That you, yeah. That was beautifully said. Yeah. And it also ties up with really interesting work that's being done uh, also up at Harvard at the business school on psychological safety. So Amy Edmondson up there has um, this notion of psychological safety that uh, Google took up. So Google is trying to figure out what uh, made for its most successful teams. And so it looked at all of its uh, most successful teams and tried to figure out what the common denominator was among them. Some people thought that it would be that you just would stick the highest performing individuals uh, on a team and that they would form the you know, highest performing team. As you and I know, <laughs> um, that is generally not the case because mm -hmm. of effects or other effects. But what they did find was the common denominator was this notion of psychological safety, which they defined as a capacity to, and I'm not going to get this exactly right, but paraphrasing, the capacity to you know, share of yourself right, and to contribute ideas without fear of reprisal or recrimination from the group. right. And so this can range anywhere from I just had a cancer diagnosis and that's why I'm missing all these meetings all the way to, you know, what do you think about self-driving cars? Is that a crazy idea or not? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, you know, notion of psychological safety is so allied with both the notion of belonging and the notion of uncovering, right? Because uncovering, right, leads to psychological safety and psychological safety leads to uncovering, right? That to me, the three concepts are deeply allied and intertwined with each other. Mm. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is like, well, well explained. You always make new connections for me. So <laughs> this is great, Kendi. We are out of time, but I, I want folks to be able to, uh, know where to find your books. So we've got covering, which is a classic from, uh, 2000, 2008, 2006, 2006, 2006. And then speak now, which was out in 2015. Can you say just a, a quick sentence about what that's about for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and thank you for uh, your kind words. Uh, so Speak Now is, is, is more of a wonky legal book, I have to say, uh, but it is a, a story about the trial that occurred in the Prop 8 case. I don't mean wonky in the sense of uh, you have to be a lawyer to read it, uh, but wonky in the sense of it really tries to argue uh, for the trial as a truth-finding mechanism and how important the fact that, that trial occurred was to the drive for marriage equality. So I think we got to Obergefell, the 2015 case that made same-sex marriage the law of the land much more quickly because there was this 2010 trial uh, in the Northern District of California. And uh, I do my best to connect the dots in a way that I don't think many people have. So cool. Okay. So definitely you'll pick those up. And then tell us about the activities of the NYU Center for DI and Belonging. Where can, <laughs> where can find, where people find uh, information on programs we can attend and, and uh, other such things? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, uh, if you just Google NYU and then diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and probably you need law school in there somewhere as well. Uh, our center will come up. Uh, we're hugely excited uh, about um, the activities that we're engaged in. If you think about it as a, you know, if you're a visual thinker like I am, I think about it as like a top bar that's about uh, interdisciplinary research on diversity, inclusion, and belonging that's particularly focused on uncovering talent. So my dean was kind enough to sort of build a center around my intellectual work. And then the two verticals underneath that top bar are, uh, first of all, internal and external, and then second, external. So the internal stuff is really trying to help our community broadly define not just the law school, but the university live up to 
its stated aspirations with regard to diversity, inclusion, and belonging uh, with reference to the best practices and the academic literature. So I mean both of those things, not just the academic literature that's been published within the law and outside of the law, but also the practical experience that practitioners like yourself would bring to uh, the table just by dint of your great experience in uh, organizations. And then the external facing part of it is targeted engagement with various organizations, you know, ranging from you know, nonprofits to universities to corporations to law firms and thinking about their diversity and inclusion issues from uh, the same set of perspectives. Like we don't do anything that isn't based in social science or in uh, the academic literature. I will say that the thing that is uh, the, oh, and before I say that, I should also say that we have events that are mostly open to the public uh, in our speaker series. So next year we are going to have um, uh, Arlie Russell Hochschild, who wrote this great book, right, Strangers in Their Own Land, um, A Fear and Mourning on the American Right, or having Mazarin Banaji, uh, who wrote the book literally on uh, unconscious bias. Uh, and we're also having Anna DeBeer Smith to talk about uh, theater, right, and how mm. theater touches on issues of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. But uh, the last thing that I wanted to say about the center and its external commitments is that the thing that we're most excited about right now is thinking about the linkages between the academic literature and theater. So we're using acting troops in order to uh, bring the teachings of the, and the lessons of this academic work to life. So we'll have seven actors simulate a uh, actual team and then they will uh, stay in role for the whole time and improvise in an interactive way with the audience based on how the audience reacts to various scenarios that uh, we've scripted for them. So we'll script, uh, you know, so just to give you an example, let's think about the, um, the Lumen Cohen study where you and I are, which you and I are both familiar with, which is if you and I were to choose a police officer, unfortunately, we would be disproportionately likely to choose a man right, uh, regardless of credentials. And whatever credentials he was strong in, uh, we would uh, say were the criterion of merit, right, because we have an unconscious bias that most police chiefs are men because most police chiefs that we've seen in our lifetimes are men. Mm -hmm. And if we um, were to um, change the criteria, so in our uh, scenario, it's a law firm, and the law firm is interviewing a man and a woman, we actually have the ability through theater to sort of bring this home. So in the first interview, the man has really strong academic credentials, but has no practice credentials. And the woman is the opposite, right? So we play that out. And then the instinct is, well, that wasn't so unfair because you know the partners make a really good case for why they hired the guy because he had all these sterling academic credentials. But then we're able to replay the skit and we just flip the genders of mm. the two parties. So now it's a woman who has exactly the same academic credentials and the man who has the practice experience. And then suddenly the partners are talking about how practice experience is crucial. <laughs> and I care she was on Harvard Law Review, like what you really need here is to hit the ground running and that's mm. who we want, right? So you just see this in practice. Mm. And I think that really hits home in a way that simply presenting the study, even in a lecture format, would not. And then people are able to react to it and absorb it and then say, OK, like we get it now. What's the solution? And the great thing about this Yale study is that it gives you the solution, which is that if you pre-commit, at least in the study, to the criterion of merit, which is, you know, you and I would pre-commit ex ante before choosing the police chief how much we believed, you know, academic credentials mattered and how much we believed experience mattered, or if we're choosing a new lawyer, like how much we believed experience or um, field experience would matter. And once you pre-commit, at least according to this one study, the gender bias not only diminishes, but it totally disappears. Right? Mm. So imagine that times 12, which is the kind of suite of offerings we're doing along sort of recruitment, retention, and then uh, promotion. Right. And you get a really rich kind of tapestry of, you know, engagements, right, with uh, individuals where individuals are not just being talked at, right, and being told the content of these studies and the solutions that we would derive therefrom, but are being given a chance to interact and to push back. And, you know, people are like, well, what if we push back and we say, you know, oh, the criteria of merit here are going to be so abstract that, you know, it wouldn't really have a pre-commitment binding effect. 
or alternatively, that was just one study, like, you know, have other studies been done in this area? That's exactly the kind of engagement we want. So far from trying to protect ourselves from that kind of engagement, we welcome it, right? And then the actors will respond in role, right? So mm-hmm. the part of the brilliance of this is that the actors never break from their characters to say, you know, oh, I'm actually this person, but rather will remain in that role for the duration of the presentation. So it's a way of marrying the kind of right brain and the left brain, because I think on the one hand, like one of the reasons we've invested so much in data and in the scholarship is because there is a really strong kind of left brain impulse, I think, that says, no matter how compelling that story was, I can't responsibly make policy based on one person's compelling story. So I'm going to discount that story unless you show me it's representative. So that's what the data does, right? But on the other hand, I think that people are moved, right, to action, not by being, you know, given reams and reams of data, but rather because a story just stays with them. So if you can do both, if you can both get them a moving story through drama or theater or through the arts or through narrative or through literature, and also show that it is a representative story, which is what our data does, then that's when you get the real kind of right brain, left brain kind of synergy, right, that's necessary to really move the ball forward. Oh, my God. I wish we could all attend all of those. So I know you probably do them for individually for companies, right? They're never open enrollment for the public. Is that true? That is true. Although currently, actually, one of our um, partnering law firms is uh, very, very close to uh, announcing that they are going to pay for the law school to do this. So oh, wonderful. Uh, have it done for our students. And that oh, is the open great. That is fabulous. Well, as a theater person and a pre a former opera singer, I so appreciate the you know the synthesis of the of the hemispheres and the learning styles that the stage um, provides. So I just love that you're doing that. And um, but Kenji, thank you so much for bringing your voice to the will to change and all of your knowledge. And you're just such an inspirational leader and researcher and full of helpful information. I just wish more people could spend more time with you because you're really, anyone that's in the room with you learning from you is truly privileged. So, um, and entertained too. Like, I just, I love it. (laughs) I always enjoy um, being on the stage with you, being in the audience. And, you know, I, um, I hope everyone Re- reaches out and researches the Uncovering Talent Report, which is available online and it's for free. I recommend it all the time and I talk about it in my book as well. And I quote Kenji and his co-author, Christy Smith, whom some of you may remember we've already had on our podcast as well. So Kenji, we had a wonderful conversation with Christy, um, who's also an incredible leader um, and role model for within the LGBT community and way beyond. So anyway, but thank you very much for your time today. And we are going to be watching you closely uh, and cheering you on. So thank you so much for your advocacy and every way that you've made the world better for all of us. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And right back at you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Will to Change, uncovering true stories of diversity and inclusion with Jennifer Brown. If you've enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. To learn more about Jennifer Brown, visit jenniferbrownspeaks.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next time with a new episode.